Well, we want to welcome you to our 46th, believe it or not, Mother's Day special from Doctrinal Studies Bible Church in Birmingham, Alabama. It has been my privilege as the pastor of Doctrinal Studies this, to, to bring the 46th message to the mothers, not only of our church, but to Christian mothers everywhere in the world, I suppose, that pick us up. We're, we're thankful for those, all of you that have come with us on the internet uh, during this time of uh, stay home uh, under COVID-19. And today, uh, I've got an, a, a kind of an unusual message, I suppose, for Mother's Day. Uh, it actually comes from 1 Corinthians 15.45, if you want to open your Bibles there for a moment. And the title of my message today is uh, the, last mo the, the Last Mother of the Last Adam. That's, that, that's an A-D-A-M, Adam. Uh, first Adam. The last mother of the last Adam. This is mentioned. My text I'm looking at is 1 Corinthians 15, 45, uh, where the idea of a first Adam and a last Adam is brought out by Paul. And so I, I want to deal with you uh, today with that idea. Now, the passage I picked 1 Corinthians 15.45 comes from one of the great uh, chapters that Paul wrote on the resurrection of Christ. It, it would be well for you to always remember two great chapters on the resurrection that Paul taught was in 1 Corinthians 15 and in 2 Corinthians 5. Just to, you might make a mental note of that. These are the great chapters that Paul... Now, he writes on the resurrection all over the place because, of course, it is a major issue, the resurrection of Christ. And we've been making a big issue of it during the month of April, and now we're into May. But Paul talks about it, uh, talks about this idea uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 45. So let me read that to you. Then we'll have a word of prayer, and we'll get into this study. Uh, Paul says in verse 45... So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. And if you have a study Bible, you'll see that he's quoting from um, Genesis uh, 2, 7. Back to 45 now. The first man, Adam, became a living soul. That's quotes of a, of, from a written Genesis 2, 7. The last Adam, the first man, Adam, Right? The last Adam, the first Adam became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Paul identifies a first Adam and a last Adam. An alpha and omega kind of that. First and a last. The first Adam and the last Adam. They're two different people in prototype. What they represent are the... Two federal heads of the human race. It was really important for you to remember that. Two federal heads of the human race. The first Adam, because of his fall, the fall of Adam, the first Adam represents the unbeliever. The last Adam, Jesus Christ, represents the believer. The two federal heads of the human race. The unbeliever, first Adam. That's Romans, the fifth chapter. And the last Adam, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the fallen humanity. And I'm going to talk about the last mother of the last Adam today on Mother's Day. Let's have a word of prayer. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. That personal sin could be mental attitude types, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. How do we get out of carnality and back into spirituality, which is the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit? I confess my sin. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, name it, cite it, identify it to God, who already knows it, 
It's for you to know it. That is sin and confess it. He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. The cleansing brings you back to spirituality. The cleansing here is not like verse 7 where it deals with salvation. This deals with the Christian life. When you commit a sin, then you have to confess it to get out of carnality and back into spirituality. That's 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3 in discussion. So let's take a moment. I give you that moment in your priesthood to confess sin if necessary. Have a moment of prayer about this Bible study for your life. You say, well, I'm not a mother. You know one? Do you have one? Then this message is for you. <laughs> so let's have a word of prayer. Well, our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the privilege that's been ours to stand in this pulpit for 46 years and to preach on Mother's Day, to encourage our mothers and to encourage ourselves about our mothers. A common denominator of the human race is a mother. And uh, how special they are to all of our lives. I pray today, Father, there's something something of spiritual importance that would be identified in, in this message today in the bigger picture of motherhood and Jesus Christ. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to do something with me because I pulled the text out of context. In other words, you're always looking for the, the context of your text. I, I said 1 Corinthians 15.45. But you see, actually, the context that we're after in this passage starts in verse 42. Now, I want to show you something really important in the Greek language. In this case, it's in the English language as well, so that's really helpful for me to make a point. The context of our passage here is going to go from verse 42 to 49. That's the context. Out of that context, I'm going to pull my text, and I did. So it's important for me to go and spend just a moment with you to show you something that's really important about what I call markers in context. You look at markers that help you understand when you pull a text what it's got to say contextually. The text has to always be consistent with the context. Now, I want to show you something. Now, watch this. In verse 42, look, it says, so also. Look at verse 45. So also. Those are markers. In the Greek language, the word and is chi, also is hutas. That's a demonstrative pronoun. A pretty powerful idea. They, they are pretty, and they're markers. And so we have the the context is broken into two sections. We have verse 42 through 44, 45 through 49. And they're talking about the resurrection, and they're talking about the, the body, the resurrection body. Now Let's take a look at verses 42 through 44. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It, the body, is sown. It's going to explain that. It is sown in, in perishable body. It is raised in perishable body. Verse 43, it is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. See what he did? Okay. Now look at verse 45. So also it is written. See, so got my, so that's the same thing. It's Kai Hotas. He wants to show you a second thing. This is point one, point two in context. And I pull my text out of the second part. 
So also it is written, and the, it, this comes from Genesis 2-7, and if you have a study Bible, look in your cross-reference, and you'll see Genesis 2-7. The first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a living spirit. Now watch what he's going to do. Watch what he's going to do now. The spiritual is not first, but the natural. Then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those uh, who are earthy, as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Look what he did. Oh, don't miss this now. In verse 45, the first man's a living soul, the last Adam, that's Jesus Christ, is a life-giving spirit. Here's what he, and here's what he means by life-giving spirit. And here's what he means by a natural soul. The natural soul, the unbeliever, and the other one in Christ is a believer. Watch what he does now. The spiritual is not first. But the natural, Adam, the natural, the 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man. That's the unbeliever. And then there's the spiritual in Christ. The natural man in Adam, the spiritual man in Christ. The first man, Adam, and the natural man is earthy. The second man is from heaven. Now watch what he does in 48 and 49. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthly. Earthy, the natural man. Came from the dirt, we'll go back to the dirt earthy and is the heavenly so are are also those who are heavenly in other words you're born into adam verse 22 if you're born into adam you're born spiritually dead verse this is 15 22 if you're in christ you're made alive that's the last adam there's the first adam everybody's dead Here's the second Adam. Everybody's alive, and everybody is connected with the heavenly, the heavenly, because of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So also, so also, so also <laughs> are those who are heavenly. And just as we bore the image of the earthy, we shall bear the image of the heavenly. One in the first Adam, one in the second Adam. Okay. See, context is everything to text. Now I want to talk about the last mother of the last Adam, who was Jesus Christ, representing the heavenly. That's, that's where I'm headed with you today. I'm going to talk about four things, and I'm going to explain to you why the first Adam didn't have a mother and the last Adam did. Let me say that one more time. I'm going to explain to you the biblical importance of why the first Adam did not have a mother, but the last Adam did. Now, here's my first point. Is point number one. If you have a paper, you can you can pull it. If you go onto our website, you can pull it down, print it out, and there you got it. If not, get a Bible, a paper, a pencil. You're going to take some notes. All right, here's first point. I got four, but here's my first one. In 1 Corinthians 15:45, Paul established two federal heads of the human race. The first Adam. And from verse 42 through 49, 42 through 44 explains it and how it affects your life after death. Establish two federal heads. You're either under Adam and uh, not saved, first Adam, or you're under the last Adam, Jesus Christ, and you are saved. Two federal heads of the human race. One's the first Adam, the unbeliever. 
because of his sin, and the other one because he's a savior from that sin. He's a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Two federal heads of the human race. Everybody is in one of those two, under one of those two federal heads. You're either under the first Adam or you're under the second Adam. If you're not saved, if you never believed that Jesus came into this world to die on a cross for your sins, not for his, was buried, and on the third day raised from the dead, which is the gospel, it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes it, Romans 1.16. And you're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works. If you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, then it is the power of God to save those who believe, and you're secured in Christ. You're now part of the heavenly while on earth. You're not identified with the earthy, even though you're on earth. You're not earthy in Adam but you are in Christ heavenly. When you die, you're going to go to heaven because you're heavenly already. In Christ, the seat at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. All right? Now, the first Adam in Genesis 2-7, Paul is quoting, so it is written, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. And in verses 45 through 49, he explains the difference. Here's the natural, here's the spiritual. Natural, 1 Corinthians 2.14, natural, that's first Adam. Spiritual, that's the second Adam. The last Adam. The first federal head is described as the first, and the second federal head is described as the last Adam. We know the first Adam from Genesis 1, 26 through 31, which Paul quotes about in this text, Genesis 2, 7, and then verses 18 through 25, second chapter of Genesis. Well worth your read to know a little bit about the first Adam. The problem is, is that when you get into the third chapter, Adam sins, and the human race is connected with his sin. Romans, the fifth chapter, 12 through 25, uh, 21. 12 through 21. Wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, that's Adam's sin, and it passed death upon, sin death upon all mankind. That's Adam's sin. For wherefore by one man sin in the world and death by sin, the sin death, and it was passed upon all men for all have sinned in Adam. The 13 judicial charges of Adamic sin in the 50 things, go to our website, doctrinalstudies.com, and watch for that. That'll flip up 50 things. To pull it down, type it out, and study it. 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin against the human race that only Christ can remove. They're all spiritual. They're, they're all judgmental. Alienated from God, blind, cursed, condemned, uh, darkness, death, under enmity, the natural man perishing, unrighteous, ungodly, under the wrath. You know, all just pick it up and study it. That, that's the natural man under Adam. That's why he's got to be saved by Christ and only Christ, only the last Adam can save everybody under the first Adam. And listen to me, dear heart, I don't care where you live and I don't care what foreign language you speak as your nat nat native tongue. You're under Adam by birth. As a human being, you need to listen to me today. Adam represents, as a federal head of a human race, represents the unbeliever. 
We know the last Adam from Luke, the first chapter, and the third chapter. Chapters 1, 2, and 3, we meet the last Adam. In Luke's glowing details, chapter 1, 2, and 3, you got to read all three of them. Don't read just one, two, or three. You got to read them all. But I'm mentioning a little bit today of Luke 1, 26 through 38, where it talks about a virgin conception by the Holy Spirit. You need to read that. I mean, that's a really important aspect. The last Adam, Jesus Christ, brought salvation and a life-giving spirit. Why a life-giving? Why a giving of life? I already have life. No, you have human life. But human life is void of spiritual life apart from Jesus Christ. Life-giving spirit. The natural man has to be born again. Nicodemus, the third chapter, 1 through 21. Please read the whole thing. Everybody quotes 16 and forget 21 verses. Remember, context, text and context. Boy, you should read 21 verses. Jesus don't get into the meat of the conversation until after 16. <clears throat> Salvation, here's, here's a living soul under, under ad of human, human race, a living soul that needs to be saved. It's a natural. It's earthy. It came from the earth. It'll stay in the earth. Talking about the body. The soul is what Christ came for. He didn't come for the body. He's going to give you a new body. He came for the soul. When you die, the body goes back to the, to, to the grave. The spirit goes back to the father who gave it. Nisha Bahayim. And your soul goes someplace in, in destiny, whether you're a mother, a father, or a young person. If you're in Christ, you're part of the heavenly system. I just read that to you out of 1 Corinthians 15, 45 through 49. And the reason you go to heaven is you bear the heavenly image right now. That's why you can, and when did you get it? You got it at the point of salvation. You were removed from Adam, Colossians 1.13. You were rescued from Adam and transferred to Christ. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. Listen, lady, if you've never believed that, you need to believe that, to have something to tell your children that is forever, forever true. You need to prepare your children not for life only, but for death. Those who prepare for life only at death are the most miserable. Jesus is a life-giving spirit. Spiritual, heavenly. Not the natural man, the spiritual man. Not the earthly, the heavenly and, and listen, and where's that image? And just as we bore the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. You already bear it and will be identified with it. In death, you are heavenly. John 14, 1, Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I like the King James. I go to prepare a place for you. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful thing? What a wonderful thing that is. When did you get it? When, when do you get that? When do you get that, that pass into heaven at the point of salvation? That's the point of entrance. No man can come to the Father except through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Do you know that? <laughs> you do now. 
I just told you. What a tragic thing it would be for a mother with children hungry for the truth, not to be able to feed them the truth. You know, the greatest privilege in life is for a mother to leave her chi lead her child to Christ. You know, the greatest reward for that is a mother who buries her child knowing that they too will one day be in the same place with the same person that's of great importance in life, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because they bo both bear the image of the heavenly Christ. Here's my second point. The first Adam had a father, but not a mother. Well, when you read Genesis 1 and 2, you will certainly discover that. Every young person that is in a Bible teaching church, they teach the creation story. I guarantee you, they're going to teach that creation. Like here, we teach that creation story all the time. We teach it to the parents who can teach it to the children. We teach it to the children who can teach their parents. <laughs> you see, his father, now listen to me, Adam's father was the creator God. He placed the first Adam prophetically into the sixth day of creation in Genesis 1, 26 through 31. And pay attention that Paul is going to call, call him later in Genesis 2, 7. Prior to the fall, he's going to call him the first Adam. Okay, just here it is, Genesis 2, 7. Paul quotes a portion of it. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground, earthy, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of lives, is plural in Hebrew. And man became a living soul. That's what Paul was after. Luke's genealogy, which is really important, Luke's genealogy, if you have your Bible, turn over there to, Je to Luke. Turn over to Luke, the third chapter, and go to the end of the chapter, the very last verse of the end of the chapter. Isn't it fun to study the Word of God? Luke, the third chapter, verse 38. Go to the period. Are you at verse? Are you in Luke thir three, thirty-eight? Go to the period. Don't start at where it starts at verse thirty-eight. Go all the way to the end of the sentence, which is the end of the chapter, to the period, and read back. See, that's Hebrew. You read back. You read from the right to the left. And here's how the story of, here's how the, here, here's how the ancestry, the ancestry, the fatherhood of the Messiah. Watch this. I'm reading backwards now. I'm reading from right to left. The son of God, look, the son of Adam, the son of Eshuk, Enush, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. See, when you read it from the start, here's how it all started. This is how he closed it out. Because the big, listen, look at verse 23. Because the subject for Luke is Jesus Christ, verse 23. And when he, Jesus Christ, began his, his earthly ministry, Jesus himself was about 30 years of age, being supposedly, the other people think it, we know it's not true, the son of Joseph, the son, and then he begins a series until we get down to God. <laughs> Here's what Paul did. Paul showed in verse 38 that the first Adam was the son of God. And in verse 23, he shows that the last Adam was the son of God. 
The difference between these two guys is the guy up here in verse 23, Jesus Christ, had a mother, and the one down here, Adam down here, the first Adam, didn't have one. Unless, unless you call it, he came from Mother Earth. <laughs> and he came from Mother Earth, then you got a mother. All right. But we don't count that in motherhood. We don't count that in motherhood. So this is kind of important to us in Luke's genealogy. In Luke, and I point it out. Here's John the Baptist's testimony when he baptized Jesus and declared him to be the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world in John 1.29. Listen to what John says. I myself have seen and have testified that the Son of God, he's referring to Jesus of Nazareth, that he just baptized, the Holy Spirit came down, all of that big scene that John has that he's recording in his heart, the Lamb of God that's come to take the sin away, he calls him the Son of God, and rightly so. Happy Mother's Day. If, it, if you're only an Adam, you don't have a Mother's Day. That would be Earth Day. <laughs> if, you're, if you're, you don't have one. You don't know what Mother's Day is all about. But if you're in that last Adam, you know what Mother's Day is all about. Who from the cross looked down at his mother and he said, Woman, behold your son. And he turned to the Apostle John, the only disciple present at the crucifixion at the end, and said to John, Behold, your mother. And John knew what he meant, and he took Mary into his home and took care of her. Jesus didn't call Mary, his mother, in death. He called her woman, for Jesus Christ died on the cross for the salvation of his mother, not his father. And he's asking John to take care of a widow. As a firstborn son, he's asking John to take care of his widow, like the book of Ruth. Like the book of Ruth. Mother's Day for Jesus. Mother's Day for Jesus. What a Mother's Day that is for Mary or John. What a deal. Even in his death, he speaks to her of the importance of her need for salvation, that he came as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. And as difficult a day that this is going to be, this Mother Day for the losses in her life, the rewards for what his, her son is doing on the cross will outstretch all of the agony of the loss. The pain that will come to her heart as declared early in her motherhood of Jesus. The joy that's been set before him is now has got to become her joy to deal with the pain of loss. You have that joy in Jesus. 
The joy set before him endured the cross. You have that joy. It's a fruit of the ministry of the Holy Spirit of Galatians 5, 22, 23. The fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience. First four are powerful, aren't they? And they only get better. This Mother's Day, you're suffering some loss. Maybe you've lost children. I stood beside my grandmother as a young man who buried her firstborn. And she kept mumbling something. When the funeral was over, I took her by the hand. And I said, Grandmother, you, you seem to be greatly disturbed. What were you saying? I, I, didn't, I didn't understand. I was holding her hand at the funeral. And I could see she was distressed, distressed over something, but I couldn't understand. I didn't want to interrupt the service or anything. And she says, it's just not right. It's not normal. It's not right for a parent to bury a child. It's out of order. And, and boy, did I understand that. Did I ever understand that? I do understand that. Here's point number three. As the last Adam, Jesus Christ had the same father as the first Adam, but also had a birth mother. Recorded in Luke, the third chapter, 30 through 38. Let me just read a couple verses. And behold, Gabriel speaking to Mary, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus, and he shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. That's prophetic. The, pro the prophetic throne that will one day be millennium. You know what you should pay attention to? In that prophecy, there's a Mary part and a Jesus part. I'm going to read it again. And you, Mary, will conceive in your womb, and you, Mary, will bear a son, and you, Mary, shall name him Jesus, Matthew 121, for he will save his people from their sin. And he, focus now is on Jesus, not on Mary. And he shall be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. See, there's a Mary part, and there's a Jesus part. There's a mother part, and there's a son part. But the son of Mary is the son of God. God's testimony. God's testimony. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Of course, that's John 3.16. Now, let me conclude. The seed of the motherhood of Christ began with Eve and continued through 75 biblical gene genealogies to Mary as recorded in Luke 3, 23-38. I put it on the paper. You, you need to pick up a study guide. The seed of the motherhood of Christ began with Eve and continued for 75 biblical genealogies to Mary. In biblical history, the seed of Christ began with Eve in Genesis 3, 15, 16, 20, chapter 4, verse 1. In Genesis 3, 15, I will put enmity... And that's angelic conflict talk between you and the woman talking to Satan between you and the woman Eve who represents motherhood and between your seed and her seed represent Messiah he Christ will bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel that's Romans 16 20 he will crush his head in the final day now here's the point the seed of the motherhood of Christ. It goes from Eve to the Sethite women of Genesis 4, 25, 26. Sethite, you know, 
Cain and Abel, they take themselves out. Cain kills Abel and is ex excommunicated. Seth becomes the bearer, the Sethite women. Eve to the Sethite women. From the Sethite women, it goes to the Shemites out of the Noah's Ark. It is passed to the Shemite women. And from the Shemite women, it's passed through the Abrahamic covenant to the Jewish women in Genesis 12, 1 through 4. It's passed from the Jewish women down to one Judean woman, Mary, the Virgin Mary, in Genesis 49, 8 through 10, and Luke 3, 31. All this references is on your study guide. Now, to make this point, Matthew points this out in Matthew 1, 1 through 6, when he talks about the Matthew's genealogy of Christ. It is in Matthew's genealogy that he mentions five women, seed, seed, five seed women uh, of the Messiah Christ. Now, you're familiar with these. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Mary. Women who carried the seed of Christ in the genealogy. It was finally passed to one Judean virgin named Mary. This is the story of Isaiah 714. And I close today to tell you that the seed of the motherhood of Christ ceased with Mary when Jesus said from the cross, Woman, behold your son, and says to John, Behold your mother. I speak to mothers today in closing in hopes that if you've never believed the gospel of Jesus Christ, you would do it today and give yourself one of the greatest gifts you could get or receive on Mother's Day, and that is to believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, that you can bear the heavenly image, you can lead your family to Christ who can bear the image and one day have a great reunion in heaven. And for those mothers who are into the motherhood of Christ in the sense of the final seed, those who are in Christ and have bear the image, this is a wonderful day in your life. Be sure you too stay on top of the the responsibility of being a good, godly mother to all the people in your family and the greater, the greater family as your kids marry and extend their families. Be sure that you're a great grandmother or a great mother to other children that are brought into your periphery. This is the message of Christ. Make sure that everybody in the great family reunion will be there because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, we're so thankful today for your love, mercy, and grace. We pray, Father, that you would encourage our hearts. I pray for mothers, how wonderful they are, grandmothers, great-grandmothers. It was a grandmother in my life that had an enormous influence. My grandparents, the, the Homans, had an enormous influence upon my life. They were just wonderful parents to me, grandparents, but parents. They parented me wonderfully. I pray that upon all the women of our church and all the Christian women and women who need to step out of the world and into the kingdom of Christ. It would be the best decision you ever made in your life in Jesus' name. Amen.